So a reminder, we are recording today's session. Uh, so we will have that for folks who uh, miss uh, today. It will be posted on our webpage, um, hopefully within 24 hours. I think it's been pretty quick. When we started the pandemic a few years ago, it took it take a few days to get it, but now it just takes about a day. Um, so it'll be posted there. Uh, welcome to our second uh, webinar here in August on energy assistance programs. Uh, today, we are going to be uh, looking at some uh, preliminary findings from the utility data that um, our state utilities uh, submitted. Um, and then we are going to be discussing, uh, picking up a conversation that we started uh, way back in June, I believe, on uh, mechan additional mechanisms for assistance. Uh, this is part of um, the statute to evaluate um, a number of uh, options uh, for additional ways to get assistance to folks. So we will uh, take a look at that today. Um, you, ha you have me, Austin, here uh, leading this work, and then I'm joined by uh, Glenn Blackman, uh, my boss at the Energy Policy Office, and uh, Julia Havens, not able to make it today, but we have Steve Dunk from our community engagement team on the line to help us uh, navigate chat and anything else that uh, pops up. So can you guys see my slide deck, first of all? I can. Um, all right, let me see if I can hit it so that you can see. Now you're just getting the slideshow. Well, we're getting your next slide too. Yeah. No. Sorry, folks. Um, this is what I'll do. And Glenn, do you want to provide an intro to today's um, workshop as well? I can do that. Um, my name is Glenn Blackman, and I'm manager of the Energy Policy Office at the Department of Commerce. And um, I've been working with Austin on this uh, project to implement the low income energy assistance provisions of the Clean Energy Transformation Act. That law that was passed in 2019 um, has a, a really important thread that runs through it that um, on the way to transforming our electricity from fossil fuels to clean electricity and more energy efficiency, that we're going to do that in a way that ensures equitable distribution of benefits to the people of the state of Washington. And part of that uh, has to do with the energy assistance programs that are available to address the, the burden of energy costs on low-income households. And so the legislature in 2019 uh, said for us to uh, regularly report back to them on the, the status of energy assistance programs for electric utility customers and to look at um, options for how uh, energy assistance might be improved either at the individual utility level or through some sort of you know statewide global changes. So this is our first report and um, we really appreciate the help that we've been getting on this, both in terms of uh, making sure that the data we have about assistance programs is uh, accurate and really captures the, the efforts that are targeted at low income households specifically. And then we also uh, really appreciate your help in uh, identifying and understanding options that might be available to do things differently in the future. It's not something that uh, the Department of Commerce could just decide to do on its own. We're really informing the legislature about these options for their consideration. But if we can uh, do that in a way that reflects the good and the bad of different options uh, as informed by your 
uh, input on that, I think it, it'll uh, result in better decisions being made at the legislature over time. So uh, again, thank you. And I look forward to um, hearing the discussion today as Austin goes through the, the information that, uh, that we've developed so far. Thank you. Thanks, Glenn. And um, start going through our slides here. Well, let's see, I gotta, oh, we gotta see if I can, here we go. Got it. All right, so for our agenda today, um, we are going to uh, be spending the first part of today uh, talking a little bit about the general mechanisms to reduce energy burden that uh, follow from the statute. Um, these aren't particular programs per se, but are just overall um, the, the, the topics or the buckets of different uh, things the state or utilities can do to reduce energy burden. Typically, this is um, thought of as a conversation between uh, direct bill assistance and energy efficiency programs. Uh, so we're hoping today folks um, can uh, talk about those uh, broad areas and uh, the strengths and uh, drawbacks of, of these different mechanisms. So we'll start today with that conversation. Um, and then we will uh, walk through uh, some of the key findings uh, from utility data to date. Um, this includes both our programmatic data data um, that we have, as well as some uh, observations we've made from uh, utility plans that were submitted as a uh, part of Section 120, our energy assistance law. And then um, we have a, a discussion around utility outreach and enrollment strategies before we break. And we will take a five minute break and then come back and uh, go through the additional mechanisms for assistance. And as Glenn said, we're hoping to have a good conversation about uh, the strengths and weaknesses of the different approaches uh, to document those for our report. Um, again, we are going to be talking today about uh, the information in the first draft report. Um, so I hope to cover all those high level uh, topics in, in that first draft. Um, and then we'll have a second draft that will uh, build on this work um, by September 27th. So as I mentioned before, um, there are uh, two commonly referred to uh, ways of uh, reducing energy burden. It's typically through direct build assistance, which uh, can be a, a rate discount, uh, for, for instance, for, for folks, uh, or a lump sum. And then uh, there's energy efficiency measures. And I think folks typically focus on these two because they're the ones, as we will see, that um, our utilities uh, engage in uh, to date. And then there are kind of two others that uh, follow uh, somewhat from the statute. One is rearage forgiveness. Uh, so this isn't necessarily like a, a plan to pay off your um, accrued uh, of rearages, but an actual uh, forgiveness uh, of um, the debts to the utility. And then, um, a, a, the statute uh, explicitly uh, mentions direct customer ownership of distributed energy resources. Um, so uh, I wanted to bring that one to this conversation and have anyone who wants to speak to any of these four um, have the opportunity to walk through some of those uh, strengths and weaknesses of these different approaches. Glenn, is there anything you would like to add on these um, before we open it up? to folks? Um, I, I guess one thing that comes to my mind is that um, even that category of direct bill assistance is uh, there's a lot of variations within that. You know, it could be uh, something that's linked to um, the customer's income. It could also be linked to their bill, you know, like a percentage discount and the rate. Um, and then there also were approaches that would try to um, provide, um, you know, a, a block of uh, financial assistance without changing the customer's rate, you know, sort of a, a lump sum monthly amount. Um, so anyway, there just are uh, 
multiple approaches that could be considered under that, uh, that overall category of uh, direct bill assistance. Thanks, Glenn, that's, that's helpful clarification. And, um, you know, for uh, some examples of things that we mentioned in the report already for these, um, so the direct bill assistance is, is typically immediate. It's a dollar for dollar um, return uh, for every utility dollar that goes towards it. It's a, a, a dollar off uh, someone's bill typically. Um, again, there's different ways to structure it. And then there's uh, the energy efficiency, which um, might not have that, per se, immediate impact um, or you know dollar for dollar impact, but can have long term uh, effects on uh, folks' energy burden. Um, it can include uh, health and safety benefits to homes that are retrofitted for these measures. So those are kind of the some of the areas that that we've identified. Um, I'm wondering if anybody else would like to, to speak to the strengths or weaknesses of these different approaches. You can raise your hand or uh, indicate in the chat that you'd like to speak. We got Sheila. Sheila, would you like to unmute and share your thoughts? Yes, thanks, Austin. Um, I just wanted to comment on a couple of challenges that maybe others are facing as well. Um, for some of our direct bill assistance, um, in, in that instant, we have a lot of programs, especially now with the COVID assistance, but we have one that is just our utility. It's donation-based, but basically after LIHEAP and other programs are, are accessed, they rarely actually have to access our program, which is a great problem to have, meaning there's so much funding, they don't need ours. <laughs> um, but you know, that's one of the things is uh, we put a, you know, have a certain amount of money set aside, it just never gets tapped into because there's so many other programs available. Um, one of the things about the energy efficiency aspect, which we love because that empowers people to kind of take control of their energy usage. Um, one of the challenges is when we get into weatherization, which is another program we have for low income, as well as all of our customers, is actually getting enough contractors on the list to be able to do some of these projects. Um, and for instance, in our community action council, they have a very long waiting list for low income weatherization which would be fantastically helpful for so many of our families around here to be able to fix broken windows and things like that. Um, and, and the greatest challenge isn't even necessarily the funding, it's having the contractors in place to be able to do it. Thank you. So those are some thoughts I have for you. Yeah, thank you, that's really good. Um... Some of those things we I hadn't uh, thought of, so I, I've taken them no, them down as notes here, and um, appreciate the comments. Anyone else want to speak to any of these mechanisms, or um, this is kind of an opportunity, I think, um, ahead of the looking at the report um, on your own to, to talk about some of these things and uh, hear what others have to say. So I appreciate folks who are step up and uh, share. So we've got John next. John saying, would you like to unmute? Yeah. Share your comment? Yeah. Um, I'm really curious. I know that there's a lot of utilities that have tons of people with past due bills. Um, like where can the arrearage forgiveness, excuse me, um, arrearage forgiveness funding come from? Um, and is there anything new with the Inflation Reduction Act, for example, or the Climate Commitment Act that might um, be applied towards arrearage forgiveness? Or are there other income streams that are already out there? Yeah, thanks, uh, John. I don't know if I have a uh a good answer for that at the moment. Um, we do have the state allocated um, 100 million 
for arrearage forgiveness, and we are working to disperse those funds right now. Um, and those would be state funds, and there'll be a, a report that goes along with um, that, that uh, funding to kind of give us a better sense of uh, additional need. Um, but where that funding would come from, I, I don't know at this time. And John, uh, you're from, uh, remind us where you're from again. Spark Northwest. Spark Northwest. Thanks, John. Yep. Hey, Charlie next. Charlie, would you like to unmute? And yeah. Remind us where you, who you're representing. Yep, yep. This is Charlie Thompson. I'm with the Northwest Energy Coalition. Um, and I just wanted to, I guess, point out um, what's beneficial or something beneficial to the last three points here. The energy efficiency and weatherization, uh, arrearage forgiveness and uh, direct customer DER ownership um, is that these are long-term solutions. Um, and I think that we often silo them from direct bill assistance um, and we're starting to and should continue to be thinking about a way to bring longer term solutions together um, and not just pumping money into bringing down uh, bills. So yeah, I, I just think that's one, um, positive thing about these these last three. Thanks, Charlie. Appreciate that. And we have Teresa next. Teresa, would you like to unmute? Yeah, thanks, Austin. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, remind us where you're from, Teresa. Uh, Puget Sound Energy. And uh, I just had a quick, I just wanted to tack on to when Sheila was speaking about weatherization and some of the challenges, um, the contractors for sure. The other challenge that I wanted to point out is when the customer is a renter and we have a landlord situation, um, oftentimes the landlord doesn't want to commit to the contract or to allow the renter to stay for you know, a period of time that makes it worthwhile to do this the work. So I'd love to see some brainstorming on how we can sort of improve that experience for both the landlord and the customer. Thanks, Sheila, for that uh, um, comment. And uh, as part of uh, the, the draft report, uh, which I hope folks uh, take a look at, um, and then the, the request for public comment, we hope to take that issue on uh, in the second draft and, and get folks as input on challenges and success stories that they've had uh, working with uh, landlords and tenants. Um, so that, that, that is on our mind, um, but not part of the, the conversation necessarily today, but we should keep that in mind. Thanks, Teresa. And I saw uh, a comment from Renee about uh, workforce issues um, down here. So I, I've noted that. Thanks, Renee. Well, this has kind of been our, uh, our warm up exercise to go through this. So this has been uh, good. I'm, nobody else has any uh, comments at the moment. Um, we'll, we'll scoot along and um, again, this would be a, a topic that you could choose to comment on in uh, the first round of comments. So let me get our slides working again here. Okay. Um, so to kind of get a, a little bit of lay of the land for Washington State based on the data that um, we received uh, from folks uh, as part of their um, submissions, back in February under this law. Um, I identified uh, 52 rate-based bill assistance programs and uh, roughly 42 of those, uh, of, uh, I'm sorry, another 42 being for energy efficiency and 23 donation-based programs. Um, I didn't encounter any arrearage forgiveness programs or distributed energy uh, resource programs, ownership programs. So let's unpack a little bit of uh, where these numbers come from and what we've done with the data. So uh, these numbers, as you can see in here, um, make uh, a, a differentiation between programs that are uh, funded by the utility. Those are those uh, rate-based programs that are by and large funded, again, from the utility. 
And then there are also uh, donation-based programs which utilities use. And we had um, uh, Sheila uh, speak to one of those programs that they have in Okanagan. Now, um, uh, these, so I made that differentiation in the data and I've made that data available on our website so you can double check and I, I please enc encourage folks to double check my work after this webinar to make sure that uh, I've correctly identified these different programs. The second thing that we did with the data uh, is we went through and we identified uh, the programs where folks could identify low income uh, households. Uh, how many were served and uh, what was the expenditure or uh, bill reduction for those households. And if the data could not identify those things, uh, we, we removed those files from the, the totals that you see here. Um, again, that's in line with section 120, which is having us look at low income household programs and with the instructions that we provided uh, back in February. Um, so we wanted to make sure that because some people reported a lot of programs uh, that, that did not count for low income households or were not even uh, residential in nature. Um, and, uh, and, and then some people reported stuff but couldn't provide the number of households served. So that makes it difficult to assess the program. Um, so that's where these numbers come. The data is available. Uh, I'm willing to answer any questions right now on any of that, as well as give you time after the webinar to, to look into these programs. The one thing I will note that I haven't noted that's on this slide is that there were two uh, renewable energy programs that uh, were reported as contributing to uh, energy assistance for low-income households. Um, one of those was an Opalco project, and the other one is a, a community solar project uh, from Mason PUD-1. Uh, my understanding is both of those were um, at least partially funded uh, through BPA grants, but it was kind of a variation within those uh, broader bill assistance programs. Uh, the energy efficiency programs, uh, it seems to me, are, are lower in number than the rate-based programs because a lot of the municipalities uh, don't have uh, energy efficiency programs on the books. Um, that seemed to me to be the key difference between those. So not seeing any comments, we'll, we'll, quick, we'll move on. Um, so within those programs that we were identifying, um, I looked at the eligibility criteria for those programs. Um, Roughly uh, two thirds of the rate based programs are open uh, to low income households. That's both the bill assistance and energy efficiency programs. Now, um, what that means is about one third of the programs have additional criteria um, for low income households. Those tend to be a senior and disabled um, a criteria. And uh, Digging a little bit deeper into the data, I found that um, with the exception of uh, Snohomish PUD and Clark County uh, PUD, I, I couldn't find any uh, Washington PUDs that offer, again, rate-based bill assistance programs to, to all their low-income customers. They are, um, the, those programs that they, they do offer that are rate-based uh, have additional criteria uh, on them. And uh, one theory is that this uh, follows from uh, is a legacy of, of Washington law. Um, back in uh, the 80s, uh, we passed uh, a law, RCW 7438070 here, um, that made it clear that uh, utilities could provide bill assistance programs and, and other um, it's not just for utilities, it's for uh, local governments uh, more broadly that they could offer uh, rate discounts uh, to seniors. It was later brought in to include uh, disabled households. And then in uh, 1998, it was uh, uh, disabled households was struck and it said all other households. So for senior 
and all other low income households. Um, and a lot of the programs that are bill assistance programs that are offered by the PUDs uh, predate uh, this RCW. Um, after, after this RCW was passed, so those programs that have been established in the last um, 20 years or so, uh, those programs uh, tend to be less, uh, have less criteria to be open to all low income households. I think about half um, are open to all low income households. So that was uh, one, one finding that we had uh, from looking at the eligibility criteria. Um, John has his hand raised. John, do you have a comment? Yeah, I think it just has to do with my understanding of what you mean by rate-based bill assistance, because like Seattle City Light gives 60% off the um, the customer charge and the rate uh, to all low-income customers. Are, are you talking about, what do you mean by rate-based bill assistance? Yeah, that's a great, um, great question. And I, I welcome folks uh, also to chime in and uh, it most likely it'd probably be best in the comments that you submit um, on September 16th about whether this term makes sense or not. Uh, again, the key distinction that I'm trying to draw is between uh, utility funded programs that again are coming uh, largely from you know utility dollars versus uh, donation based programs. And so um, in the process of, of looking at those two and having conversations with folks, it seemed to me that um, simply saying utility programs here uh, might not uh, sit well with uh, some of the utilities um, because they, they contribute admin and everything and some other uh, components to their do largely donation-based programs. So I uh, said rate-based here. If folks don't think that's a good term, I'm happy to, scrub it and, and find another one and willing to take suggestions. Um, obviously, Great. I can't, can't go through right now and change that. Um, um, but uh, going forward after September 16th, we certainly can. Awesome. I, I guess I'm still confused why like Seattle's Seattle City Lights program would not be considered rate based bill assistance. Do they not use uh, customer rates to fund it? So um, I'm trying to figure out, uh, so the, what this slide is saying is that for all the utilities, investor-owned utilities, for the P public utility districts, the PUDs, the municipalities, and the co-ops, roughly two-thirds of those are open to all low-income and they're uh, uh, rate-based. Uh, yeah, um, uh, now, if we're looking at the public utility districts in particular, um, they're the ones that are offered, that are highlighted in the second bullet. It would not include Seattle City Light. Seattle City Light, uh, my recollection, uh, is a, a program that is open to all low-income customers. And it's a rate-based program. It's not a donations. Good questions. Any other comments or questions on the slide or anyone who want to speak to maybe why, why our, our PUDs have a, a additional criteria on these and whether or not uh, that should be a concern. All right, if not, we will move on. Uh, let's see here, get my slides working again. All right, so some high level takeaways uh, that we also found from the data. Um, first of all, is that the section 120 has uh, created uh, six new or has created programs uh, for six utilities that previously did not have uh, low income bill assistance programs. Um, but one is a uh, kid to task. Um, the other is uh, 
city of Chihuahua, and then there's four co-ops that didn't have programs. So that's what who comprises that those six there. Um, so they're launching these programs. Um, most uh, public utility districts and municipalities are tweaking their programs or restructuring them to align with, with the goals of Section 120. And then uh, one observation I made was that there, there are broader and deeper reforms uh, by the investor-owned utilities. And those uh, reforms are, are being driven by a bill that was passed in 2021, Senate Bill 5295. Um, it was largely a bill that um, looked at rate structures, um, and then it had some provisions in there for energy assistance, which we'll talk about a little bit more uh, going forward. Um, we talked a little bit about what utilities are planning to do uh, in our last sec in our last meeting. Um, so I don't want to take too much time on this slide, but just to make people aware of some of the high level takeaways and that we have posted on our web page a word document uh, where I attempted to uh, lightly summarize the, the work that utilities have already submitted as part of their assessments under 120 on their future plans for their programs. Uh, that, so there's a summary there and I kind of grouped utilities under what I thought were common uh, titles. So you'll find one, for instance, about uh, the public utility districts that are tweaking or restructuring their programs. You'll see another one that's, you know, uh, groups, utilities that are looking to expand the programs they already have on the books and uh, so on and so forth uh, for the different categories of utilities. So that's available. And as part of the public comment period by September uh, 16th, I'm hoping folks can take a look at that and uh, provide me feedback either on the content or in the way that it's organized. Um, I do not plan on making that a formal part of the report, but I would like to have a, a summary document for folks posted on our webpage that people can view uh, once the report's made public. Any observations from folks? Um, not, um, Let's move to uh, utility outreach and enrollment strategies. So we've uh, talked a little bit about this previously uh, at our workshops, and um, I've done some more uh, deep dives into the utility reports and tried to summarize what I was uh, seeing there. And uh, there, I, I divided these kind of tools and strategies into two groups. Uh, one is a, kind of a traditional outreach and enrollment tools that folks have been uh, relying on for some time. This includes the CAPS, which are the Community Action Partnerships. There's a 39 of, of these across the state and they help uh, utilities and federal and state programs implement uh, low income programs. And, and crucially for utilities, uh, they seem to be the, the critical link for income verification uh, for eligible households. Um, the other type of outreach I saw was through local organizations and community events. Uh, these include uh, uh, churches, schools. Um, if, for instance, some cities had a, a local agency that they worked with regularly, or the PUDs had a countywide organization that they'd work with uh, to reach out to folks and let them know about the program. And then uh, a lot of folks mentioned uh, attending community events uh, with their utility uh, program information and sharing that with uh, the public that way. And then finally, uh, under the additional tools, some uh, utilities have been uh, doing some mapping of energy burden and uh, low income households in their service territory. Uh, some utilities have been hiring consultants to do that work. But there are also others uh, like Cowlitz and Benton who have been uh, using uh, tools that they have in house. Um, for instance, their IT staff, um, which maybe not all utilities have access to, uh, but they've been using their staff and uh, census data 
to to begin getting at some of the the questions in section 120 and uh the final bullet here use of federal and state resources i'm right now unaware of utilities that are really tapping into uh, dshs um, and, and other uh, administrators of state and federal uh, low income programs but uh, one of the things that i'm hoping to bring back to the group in the second draft is more information about how we could use those resources uh, to increase outreach and enrollment um, of low-income households and utility programs. So I've been talking a lot, Does, and I'm, I'm interested in the, this kind of resonates with folks. If I'm missing something, um, if I'm overstating or understating anything uh, to this point. So Anna from Vista, Anna, would you like to unmute and share a comment? Yeah, definitely. Good afternoon. So um, looking at the out, the traditional outreach methods, are we just saying that um, collectively overall that the community action agencies were the primary and sole source for outreach? Because I think, um, you know, from a utility, we put a lot into raising awareness around the availability of these programs. And so a lot goes into marketing, you know, mm -hmm. and, and then when I start talking about this, I think about, you know, outreach really could use a benefit of definition because there's there's the awareness raising that you do, and that could be the marketing, you know, maybe we're sending emails out to customers, you know, maybe we have a print ad in a local publication or a senior resource guide, and then there's outreach that the agencies do. And so, like, as an example, Community Action serving Whitman County, they go to rural um, towns like Colton, and they are in the library once a month conducting intake appointments. And then, you know, outreach can also include that we host energy assistance days in partnership with the local community action agency. And so it's a couple of days that we take at the fairground and, you know, we market to our customers to sign up for an appointment and come and be qualified for bill assistance. So it's, you know, outreach is pretty robust. I think there's a lot of requirement under the law to make sure that we're engaging, you know, that one, we're raising awareness about the availability of these programs and that we're using, you know, all kinds of methods, your usual channels and unique and uh, unique and innovative approaches to engage with audiences in a way that we never have before. And then, and so outreach and marketing are one thing, but access, you know, that enrollment is another is another point as well. And so are we modifying our programs so that people can easily access the benefit and get enrolled? And so, you know, with the bill discount in Washington State um, under Senate Bill 5295 that some of us are implementing, you know, attestation, simple attestation of income, you know, with verification of a random sampling is a strategy for increasing access and enrollment. Or maybe, you know, having an online application or collaborating with your local CAP to have an online application through the utility that can be submitted to the CAP. You know, those kind of things are different strategies around outreach that also feed into access and enrollment. So there's just a long gamut here, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I just think it, 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 there, there could be more here. Perfect. Thanks, Anna. And I, I appreciate that. And, um, it definitely is something that I, I struggle to, to balance. You know, we've got so many different utilities um, with uh, different amounts of resources and kind of summarizing these, uh, the tools that are available to them and that they're using. Um, it, it can be easy to, to miss stuff. So uh, I appreciate if folks took a look at uh, the outreach and enrollment section and looked at it and said, does this, is this accurate? Are we missing things? and uh, provide that in comments uh, for September 16th. That would be really helpful for me. Um, the, the one thing I would say is keep in mind that uh, I, just, I think sometimes folks uh, look at it from their utility perspective, and that's helpful for me to get. Um, but I am writing uh, and uh, for, for, for all of them. So uh, I have to be able to differentiate those and what they're what different folks are doing um so so help me uh, clarify when when folks are doing something uh, 
uh, different than other folks. It helps me uh, keep that in mind when I'm looking at this. So Jeff, uh, why don't you unmute and share? Yeah, thoughts. thanks Austin. Um, this is uh, Jeff Feinberg from Summish County PUD and um, just kind of piggybacking on this part of the conversation. Um, you know, maybe it's just as simple as kind of out, outlining like traditional outreach partnerships and enrollment tools that utilities are utilizing and then you know making some sort of uh, direct comment as well as to you know you utilities are using their own communications teams um, for varying other types of outreach um, and you know I know uh, for those for those of us that are able to do that we could potentially you know share some of the examples of maybe some segmented marketing that we've done um, or something to that effect where we've tried to make it really clear to customers whether it's a press release or something like that um, about what might be available and, and our ability to kind of support them and engage with them. Uh, just so we're making the distinction that, you know, utilities are indeed doing that kind of work um, on their own, but then they're also looking for these partnerships out there in the community to also leverage for outreach as well. That's great. Thanks, Jeff. And um, I was wondering if anyone on the line uh, from a smaller, um, consumer-owned utility could speak to the resources they have uh, available to them, whether they have kind of a communications team of person on board or if, or if uh, it's largely done uh, either directly from the CAP agency um, and, and paid for by the utility or um, other mechanisms that they use. I, I, I do uh, recognize that one thing I missed here was definitely talking about um, kind of the, 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 the paper materials that people send, flyers, um, newspaper ads, as well as uh, the digital communications, which I think folks are really tapped into and in, in, uh, leveraging those resources, both uh, here in the energy assistance work, but also across um, CETA more broadly, including the clean energy implementation plans. So that would be something that I need to, to highlight. But if, if there's somebody from a smaller utility um, that would like to share kind of how they conduct outreach, that'd be really helpful as well. Sheila, see, you raise your hand. Yeah, I guess I can speak again about that. Um, I am uh, the public relations coordinator for Okanagan PUD um, and pretty closely connected with a lot of my colleagues across the other PUDs <laughs> when it comes to communications. Um, and sometimes um, this position exists in other small utilities and sometimes it doesn't. I know a lot of co-ops are uh, even smaller staff than we are um, and they have outreach or you know, community outreach, public relations, communications as a shared duty between someone else, maybe someone in customer service or HR or that sort of thing. So it's, it's pretty rare actually uh, for a consumer owned utility to actually have a team of communicators. And so a lot of us rely on each other to help get word out um, and then with other agencies as well. Um, I would say a majority of us have one person, maybe full-time, maybe part-time devoted to communications. Um, there are a few exceptions as some of the larger consumer owned utilities, um, but in general, that's kind of where I think most of us land. Thanks, Sheila, that, that's helpful. Um, that feedback, Kelly. Um, yeah, can you hear me okay? I can. Remind us where you're from again, Kelly. I'm with Big Bend Electric. We're in um, eastern Washington. We cover from Ritzville to Pasco, and we're a very small co-op. Um, and I wear many hats, communications, marketing, rebates, public relations, electrical safety, and the list goes on for, for me. Um, but some of the things that we've been doing are... Um, you know, I've been advertising it on social media and in our monthly magazine publication. Um, we haven't done bill stuffers yet, but it is on my list um, to get to that. 
Um, another option that I think somebody had said in a, a previous workshop that I added to my list was to go to um, area food banks and places like that, maybe set up my booth display and, and try to get, get more outreach that way. Um, so, so far that that's about it. Thanks, Kelly. That's, that's helpful. Um, again, I just am uh, astounded when I look at the reports, both of these and the, the clean energy implementation plans and uh, just at the, the variety of utilities and, and circumstances in, in our state and uh, want to make sure that we, we capture that here. So as you look at um, the report, um, please uh, let me know how you guys are um, looking at it from your different utility perspectives. That's really helpful uh, for me. Um, the next slide continues on this conversation. Uh, so I will uh, just move over there. And if, if folks still have thoughts on this, uh, feel free to, to bring those up. Um, there's uh, a number of parts in section 120 that, that are asked of, of utilities on outreach. Anna was talking to a lot of them. Uh, this includes uh, coordination with community organizations, uh, consultations with tribes, and then asks utilities to assess their comprehensive enrollment strategies for vulnerable populations. And then our uh, particular uh, reporting report asked about un underserved populations, uh, which people uh, typically anecdotally suggested rural households, renters, tribes, and non-English speaking households. So I've tried to capture these in uh, distinct headings uh, or subheadings in the report, on this, uh, particularly in the section on uh, outreach. And a, a few things that I'll note, note in the report and that I'm hoping folks can help me out uh, both on this call, but also um, in the public comments. Uh, on September 16th. Uh, the first is that um, when it comes to uh, coordination and consultation with community organizations, uh, the investor-owned utilities, which again are, are bigger utilities and subject to, to a different set of statutes uh, uh, and, and uh, requirements under uh, the Utilities and Transportation Commission, uh, they, they had a fair amount of uh, consultation with community organizations built into their uh, uh, regular utility process. This includes having low-income advisory boards uh, with members of these organizations. They had equity advisory groups, which were established as part of CEDA, uh, and, and they bounced ideas off of those groups as well. Um, and, then, and then just more community interaction and seeking out, um, you know, non-traditional uh, partners. And I'm sure uh, that this is, uh, it is all seems relatively new. And so there's a lot of growing going on in that area, but it seems rather robust to work there. And then looking at the consumer owned utilities, uh, it was to me from what was submitted and what I've seen from the clean energy implementation plans, uh, a less robust process, um, fewer, you know, non-traditional community organizations being consulted, less programmatic changes uh, from those consultations because uh, they might not be, be happening. Um, there's no requirements for consumer owned utilities to have low income advisory groups or equity um, advisory groups. And uh, it seems like nobody reported having those. And I'm not sure if that's a, a, something that exists that, I, that I, I'm unaware of, um, or if, if they just don't exist at this time. Uh, so that was kind of a, a contrast uh, between those two that I uh, sought to highlight in the report. Um, because it was something that I observed. And if I, uh, if that is, if what I've had in the report or what, and what I've just described, which is basically what's in the report, if that seems off or doesn't resonate with people, uh, that folks let me know. 
uh, and uh, give me additional information. And I've asked for that in uh, the public uh, request for public comments. But if folks want to jump on right now and talk about that, uh, talk about their utilities, particular process, and consultations with community organizations, uh, that would be helpful, I think, for the group. That includes both the uh, investor owned, maybe Anna could help us out, understand uh, their, what they've been up to, and then uh, some of our smaller utilities, which um, may not have the resources to do a lot of this work. Um, or traditionally been uh, required to do it. You did say Anna, right? Yeah, I did. I, did. <laughs> I called you out. <laughs> so I, my first inclination is just to share um, some work around community partner networks. Um, so, and I think that this origin, when we set this up, it originated out of commerce and rental assistance and the want to partner with buy-in for organizations. So those organizations that aren't traditionally in the role of providing any form of assistance, maybe rental assistance, utility assistance, or anything like that, but they're just convening, you know, and they're a trusted entity for underserved, hard to reach um, populations. And so um, we tried to do that um, during debt relief, you know, with COVID, but there is a lot to engaging with those populate, those organizations. Um, you know, they don't have the infrastructure to deliver our programs in the, in the tri traditional means. And so, um, you know, we, we need to revisit that and, and come up with a better way on how we can position them to be successful in operating in the space of helping people with their utility bill and account. That's helpful, Anna. And could you, you speak a little bit to um, the, the low income and the equity advisory groups that you have where those kind of originated and how, how you, those benefit your guys' work? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So we have the Energy Assistance Advisory Group and that was um, founded after a general rate case in 2015, where we had the charge to go and look at our low income rate assistance program and consider a rate discount. And during that conversation, you know, with our, our stakeholder um, community action agency representatives, and then also some folks from like the energy project and public council and the commission, we all decided that it would probably be good to have an oversight entity for our low income rate assistance program. And so, um, with that, we convened the group in 2016. You know, we defined goals for our program. And so collectively, we've just been having conversations about how our program can best serve individuals. A lot of the conversation has been on program design, um, but, but, you know, in support of my previous comments around outreach and education, um, you know, we're, we're going to start moving that way, especially with Senate Bill 5295. How are people made aware of programs and how can they easily access them, you know, to make sure that we're getting good utilization of the programs that we have in place? You know, I think we all know that we have an amount of funding and we have an amount of need in our communities, but a lot of us are achieving about 17 to 21 percent um, saturation rates. So what I mean by that is like of the eligible population, how many people are being served by the programs that are available? And so, you know, is it that people aren't aware or is it that people don't trust or they don't find the ways to get to those programs accessible and easy? And so I think that's gonna be a big conversation for us going forward. And then the equity advisory group was born out of the need, you know, basically a requirement of CETA, the clean, you know, the Clean Energy Transformation Act that we're all talking about here today. And so with that, we convened um, some leaders and communities throughout our service territory to have conversations about what an equity advisory group should um, be convened to do. And once they're convened, you know, what are the means and mechanisms that you engage with underrepresented populations? And then um, how do you get that that representation, how do you engage them in a manner that's going to be meaningful for them? 
you know, that we're not just checking a box, that we really truly want to have our customer representation and having these hard discussions around the clean energy transformation. And so one thing that we did is we didn't go to your traditional directors and executives and policymakers, you know, that convene these kind of groups. We went what you call deep into the bench. You know, when we went to an organization, we were looking for an intake worker or, you know, we went to a mobile home park that we had an outreach relationship with. And we and we asked somebody that lived in that mobile home park to serve on our energy assistance advisory group. And so, you know, with that, we hope that we get some really good, meaningful discussions about how we can make sure that everybody's included and in, and in benefiting from our work. Well, thanks, Anna. For sharing, for sharing that. Um, yeah, thank you. And I, we'll be circling back to some of that later too. Um, and the differences there between the IOUs and COUs. Um, does that, how do the COUs, when they think about their consultation with community, uh, community organizations, if, are, am I, off the mark and thinking that you guys are are there's a kind of a limited work that's being done and then uh, uh, just kind of what what work are you guys doing and um, what are kind of the the successes and challenges that you face in doing that work would be would be some of the information I'd be interested in hearing about. Don't be shy and share. Maybe we can pick on a, pick on a few folks. Uh, let's start with our bigger ones. So maybe Jeff or Chris could uh, share with us what Snowflood or Benton's doing around uh, engagement uh, with community organizations. Jeff raised his hand. Sure, Austin. <laughs> I, I was. Uh, this is Jeff uh, with Snohomish County PD. Um, and yeah, so you know we're uh, definitely looking at how we can build out um, kind of really a, a community stakeholder group. And this is something that we had started doing back in 2018 when we were really just trying to kind of assess our program and make sure that it was providing meaningful benefit, you know, to to all our customers. Um, but we haven't done much of that since the pandemic, um, obviously, because kind of in-person meetings and that sort of thing has been challenging. So we're, we're just kind of teeing that back up. And so the group we're kind of identifying are those in our community that are doing, you know, income qualified housing assistance. Uh, we've got the Food Bank Coalition involved. We've got some other service organizations such as Volunteers of America, United Way, those kind of groups. And, and kind of our idea is really to, um, you know, not just potentially leverage those uh, relationships as outreach opportunities, but also to just try to ensure that um, really to learn what we don't maybe already know about our customers and maybe uh, think we know because of data points and that sort of thing. And so we just want to make sure that we've got the programs that would provide the most meaning, um, you know, for our shared customers. And so that that's kind of what we're doing next. Um, and, and we're really just kind of teeing that up, hopefully trying to get one here scheduled for the fall or early winter is our, our goal. Thanks, Jeff, for sharing. Someone other than Snowpud on our consumer-owned utility side want to share if they've considered this work or um, are currently doing, doing some form of it or uh, have any thoughts on what Anna shared for the IOUs? If not, um, we can move on. I'm hoping uh, on this, the next uh, topic here on this slide, uh, which is consultation with tribes, um, that both uh, both this consultation with community organizations and tribes 
that folks uh, can help me out and provide more information about the work that's being done. Because uh, again, I, I'm, uh, the, the reports that we got um, seem to particularly skip over the, the, the tribal aspect um, for folks. I don't think uh, it was necessarily highlighted in a way that uh, could really elicit a response um, from folks. So I'm hoping that uh, in the public comments, uh, folks with tribes and their service territories could uh, tell me a little bit more about their work that they've done or they are doing. We did have folks say that they're, they're beginning that under the Section 120 to reach out to tribes and um, that's, that's awesome. And we have uh, folks who, uh, you know, maybe are IOUs that have these, these advisory groups or low income groups that tribes are part of those or involved in some other stakeholder engagement process um, that you could share with us uh, that information uh, that would be really helpful because I, uh, I think it was largely just a, an omission uh, on the report and um, it'd be good to kind of get some clarification on what folks are uh, doing uh, with tribes. So I've, I've put that in the uh, public comments uh, as well, uh, a request for, for more information on that particular topic um, and, and available for right now if folks want to share. Um, so we got Dale. Dale, why don't you unmute and share where you're from? All right. I'm from Okanagan. And I guess when, when we reached out from our utility to our local tribes, um, the biggest thing that we found was that their definition of needing households was double the threshold that community, that commerce has us using. And they had enough, they had so much money that they were having trouble actually finding enough people to help. You know, so even the local tribe was having the same issues that everybody here is bringing up that, you know, in some cases, some people were using their programs a lot, but in some cases, people weren't even coming forward and looking for help, even with uh, their threshold, you know, potentially being double our threshold. So. Yeah, thanks, Dale, for sharing that. Um... I do have you guys down as, as one of the groups that, that uh, spoke to this issue and, and um, having this extra information uh, is really helpful. So I appreciate it. Anyone else want to speak to their work with tribes, share their experiences? I've heard some some utilities. I can't remember who um, talk about uh, difficulties of uh, like matching up uh, different tribal members with their service territories, um, uh, other things like that were, were noted in the reports. So if not, we got it don't have a very talkative group today. We will uh, move on and I hope that you can, uh, that folks who, who have tribes uh, in their service areas can, can let us know a little bit more about what they're doing. Ginger has her hand raised, Ginger. Yeah, Austin, I don't know, can I ask questions rather than making the comments here? Yeah, you can, you can ask questions. Okay. Um, I'm not sure, you know, some folks, we might have folks who can help uh, answer those questions. I might be able to, but we might not, but I can definitely, questions are really good for me because people think of things that I don't <laughs> even think of. So I appreciate it. You know, regarding to consultation with tribes, uh, I'm just wondering if any of the utility companies here or the, the uh, resources available have consulted with like uh, urban Indians, uh, the leaders, or like uh, organizations that are designated to serve the 
the native tribes. So I'm just wondering uh, if that has been, you know, done to conduct more outreach so the community will know better what um, what resources are available. Just curious about this. And is, are organizations like that statewide or are they, they local? How, how would we uh, learn about them if we are? Yes, some of them are local. Um, some of them may be statewide, but uh, I'm more familiar with King County, for example, um, like uh, Indian Health Board, right? And the Chief Seattle Club or uh, like an Eagle Soaring as well. Those are some of the organizations uh, serving uh, the Native American or like Potlatch. Uh, that organization also serve as a conduit to bring a lot of Native American leaders, organizations together. Um, so I think that could be very helpful for urban, you know, urban Indians mm -hmm. that may not directly access the services to their tribes per se. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Ginger, for that. Hassan, how are you doing, Hassan? Hey, Austin. Uh, here, let me see my camera. Uh, yeah, Hassan Shaban, Empowered Data Works. The, the, the one thing I can offer up for the consultation with tribes is when we were looking at Pacific Powers uh, assistance programs in Yakima County, uh, it just came up. Uh, some of the community action agencies mentioned that because the tribes implement some programs in-house, so for example, weatherization is implemented by uh, the, the Yakima Indian tribe. Uh, so so the, it, it seems that th there's not always a good referral system between the programs that are being run uh, within the reservation and the programs that are being run outside. Uh, so that just struck me as a thing where there's, there's potential for collaboration between the agencies, the utilities, and the tribes uh, to make sure at least that the referrals are flowing in, in all directions. Thanks, Hassan. That's really helpful. All right, I was making sure I was up the speed on our chat. Um, and, and that I think some of that will also uh, lead into the, the other bullet here, which is around enrollment strategies for vulnerable populations. Um, often these can be overlapping groups. And uh, I welcome comments. Uh, on September 16th on 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 this topic as well. Uh, it seemed to be uh, rolled up into uh, general comments in uh, the report form. And if folks have things that they'd like to share with us, um, I, I'd appreciate getting that information. And we can update these parts of the report as part of a second draft uh, based, on, based on that info. Ginger. Yes, so under your uh, the slides here, you talk about the rural areas or renters mm -hmm. uh, and non-speaking, non-English speaking households. And there are a group of, like people with different mental or intellectual disabilities or the families who are raising uh, maybe young children or adults who have disabilities, but also come from the BIPOC community. These are our considers underserved the population as well, or um, like a, I would say those who experience a risk of being homeless, I think that would be very good to tap together with the program. Um, like I, I think earlier Anne was talking about um, the rental assistance program, right? If we can combine uh, the services directly with those agencies that are already provide rental assistance and give them additional fundings to do the work, then it's easier to, to share these resources. The, 
than each individual family uh, who are who are needing these services. They don't have to go to two or three different agencies to get the resources. And at the same time, that also help the case workers to figure out, okay, I have the rental assistance. I have, uh, I also have a utilities assistance. So that when they come together, it's easy for our distribution as well. And even with the food assistance comes together, that will be even better. Um, and that's what we have learned throughout the pandemic. When open doors for multicultural families, we were able to do a lot of rental assistance. You know, we distributed over fifteen million dollars worth of rental assistance so far. But for utility, we only have like ten thousand dollars, and that doesn't really match to the needs because we know if you need a rental assistance, likely you need the, you know, the utility support and also food as well. So I, I think it's a system need to coordinate better in that way. And then you can save your time to go through another RFP. You can also save your time for the case workers. You save time for us to do the paperwork. You have to do this paperwork, that paperwork. Can we figure out the paperwork, the needed, needed paperwork in one form that can you know, serve different purposes for different functions? Yeah. So these are the areas I think linked to the organizations, particularly that are serving that uh, organization that serve the population. Like if you have a non-English speaking household, who are the staff speak the language of the community of the families they serve, instead of just only have a organization says that, okay, we will use interpreter. Because you, when you use interpreter, it doesn't really help to communicate that well. There's a, so much barriers rather than um, when you have somebody who speak the same language as the community, as the families who needs help, and they can always call them back because we know many of these families we serve, they rely on their phone. But if you're gonna communicate through the email, um, or you want to hand them a piece of paper, ask them to fill it out, they don't understand what to do. That is really crucial to have this, like a cultural mediators or cultural navigators or in at Open Doors, what we call a family support specialist who have the direct access to the families in their language, understand the method of how they communicate and are able to assist them to fill out needed form and also do the meaningful intake to understand what their needs are. Yeah, that's really helpful, uh, Ginger, to, to think about it from that, that perspective. I, um, you know, I tend to, uh, from what I know about utilities, I think about, about it from that, that perspective. And so getting these thoughts here uh, and like the underserved populations here, these are um, categories that uh, I pulled from reading uh, the responses to the utility report. So there may be other groups here that uh, maybe we didn't think about as we uh, as, as utilities filled out those parts of the report or um, just that we, we didn't capture. And so I welcome feedback on that as well. If there's, if there's other folks here that uh, are likely uh, would fall within this group, um that'd be helpful yeah, yeah sorry if i can add a little bit when you talk about income right so we did the survey last year to a community we received 543 responses back uh about 54 percent of those participants in our focus groups uh tell us that they have less than thirty five thousand dollars in annual income and mm -hmm. you can see that that is the population we need to reach out to because they likely, they will need the rental assistance and utility services. Um, so that that's why the population I mentioned earlier was not listed here, actually is a kind of missing population. Yeah. Perfect, thanks Ginger for that clarification. 
Well, we've spent a lot of time on this, which I think is good. Um, I'm hoping folks will spend more time uh, thinking about it as well and um, provide some uh, public comments to help inform our report. Uh, again, this section, um, you know, I saw some things uh, from looking at the different reports, but wasn't sure if I was missing, uh, missing information or what have you. And so uh, any feedback on that would be great, uh, particularly from our consumer owned utilities on uh, their programs, if they, if they think I'm uh, missing something or overstating uh, uh, or understating something. I'd really like to get that feedback from folks in the, in the public comments. Um, so our next section is going to dive in to uh, the evaluation of additional mechanisms for assistance. And so before we do that, I thought um, we're moving ahead of schedule, so that's great. Um, maybe we'll take a 10 minute break and uh, get back together here at um, 2.30. That sounds good to folks. Get some, get some stretches in, some water, et cetera. Um, so let's plan on doing that. Stop sharing my screen for the moment. And I'll see you guys in 10 minutes. Thank you all.
right. Hope everybody had a good break, refreshing break. I spent mine eating cherries. So get my little sugar rush going here, make the last uh, half of the webinar or workshop. Um, so uh, next we are gonna uh, move into discussing uh, the different uh, policies that the legislature or, or mechanisms that the legislature asks us to evaluate. And I have kind of rearranged the order to uh, hopefully liven things up and uh, get folks uh, talking about these. Um, we've also added a few additional ones to what the legislature suggested and I'm hoping to get uh, people's uh, assessments of, of, of how we've summarized these and the strengths and drawbacks to the different uh, approaches and mechanisms. So I'll skip over that slide now. So today, hoping to start with the uh, system benefits charge here. Um, we have Glenn. Glenn, uh, would you want to introduce this one and sh share this one uh, with the group? Sure, I can talk about this a little bit. Um, it's mentioned specifically in uh, Section 120 of the Clean Energy Transformation Act. Um, and if you're a utility and you do any work in Oregon, um, you might know about a systems benefit charge that's used there to fund um, energy efficiency and renewable energy programs through the Energy Trust of Oregon. <clears throat> uh, so that's the closest um, geographically example. And um, there are other examples across the country, uh, really quite a few, where um, a public purpose uh, objective would be uh, funded through a um, you know a mechanism where uh, a fee is collected um, as part of the utilities rate structure, and then that money is used to uh, to pursue that public purpose, whatever it might be, and. Um, there's also examples uh, that are, they don't carry quite the same name, but um, from other industries like the um, in telecommunications, um, affordable telephone service in rural areas is possible in part because of uh, uh, fees that are assessed across the board on telecommunications in order to um, create a fund to do that. So the concept uh, under this uh, option would be uh, to develop a mechanism where there'd be a charge assessed on utility services. Uh, the money would be then uh, used either, you know, administered at the state level or allocated out to individual uh, implementers to address energy burden uh, among low-income customers. And I think, you know, one uh, disadvantage that I would say that I, I see in that is that it, uh, you know, it may uh, lose some uh, local touch if it, you know, if it's kind of run <clears throat> from the state level I don't, I don't know if that's true or not, but it seems like it's at least a possibility. And one of the advantages that uh, I see in this would be that it uh, could address a concern that we've heard um, from some of the utilities that serve rural, uh, disproportionately low-income service areas, is that uh, then the the burden of meeting the energy need wouldn't be carried completely by the uh, the other customers in that service area. That the, um, the non-low income customers across the state would be um, uh, carrying the burden for 
all of the low income customers in the state. And so it could uh, result in a more um, uniform uh, distribution of, of the both the results and the, the contributions into it. Um, and then as noted on this slide, one of the advantages of uh, a uniform statewide approach might be that um, some of the mechanics of the program, um, like income verification, enrollment, uh, communication and outreach could be done uh, uniformly through some sort of state system. So there's a lot of uh, maybe and if and all that in there, but uh, it's just what we've, um, We've, been, we've thought about and heard about so far in terms of uh, the, the things to think about with a system benefits charge. Somewhere, Glenn, our slide on uh, drawbacks ran away. So we'll have to bring those back sometime, but they are in the report. So yeah, get in there. And uh, to answer John's question, um, Yes, that would definitely need uh, legislative authority. Basically, all the options we're looking at, uh, we're looking at them because the legislature uh, in 2019 said, um, you know, bring us back some more ideas or some evaluation of ideas. Uh, I don't think we have one in the, in the list that we could do uh, just with our existing authority. Any thoughts on uh, this um, this proposal from the utilities? Either last time we heard uh, I, from a Vista a little bit about how the systems benefit charges work for them. I'm happy to have them uh, speak again to that, or have other folks um, who have interests or uh, interested in this idea and who have questions, ask their questions, or provide uh, you know positives or uh, drawbacks that, that we haven't mentioned or would like to underline something that they see um, real clearly about this proposal. I'm wondering if uh, somebody from our uh, consumer-owned utilities, maybe our smaller ones, uh, have any thoughts on this or would like to speak to it. Um, I do see we got Nicholas on the line. So maybe Nicholas, if, if you have any thoughts on system benefits charge for the public utility districts perspective, that'd be great to get that. So um, I wanna be clear that I have not discuss this issue with anybody. So any perspectives I give at this point are my own and only my own. Um, I, I do th agree that uh, it could be very efficient. Um, I wonder a little bit about if there's going to be a differences depending upon the level, of, the amount of need, because some of the utilities that we deal with <clears throat> have not many people who are who are you know fall into the need category, but the, the the depth of their need is really significant. And we have others who uh, just about everybody is in need, but they're all kind of at the same level. And so you know how this would how the money would be spent would be a, a question. How it would be distributed, and then what would the system benefit charge be? I mean, uh, if we're going to meet the levels of the that are identified in the statute, uh, I would assume that the, the charge would be high, but I don't know. And it would be uh, interesting to find out what that charge would be and how would it compare to someone's existing bill? And would it be a proportion of their existing bill or would it be a fixed amount? Um, and those are the sorts of questions that I think you'd have to kind of think through in order to figure out whether or not you know this is something that you that people could just in generally get behind, but I do see certain advantages, and the ones you you laid out I think are 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 
you know the right ones so I'm not trying to say this is a bad idea i'm just trying to figure out what it would actually look like if it was uh, implemented or if we wanted to discuss this further oh it's really helpful feedback uh nicholas and uh, we know that we're kind of for some folks that this is maybe the the first time they're looking at it and and understand that if uh, you have a thought that you want to share we won't you know you're you're welcome to think about it more afterwards and consult with folks and then share it in the public comments either the first draft or second draft um, but those are good good questions um, and uh, if people have questions that they'd like us to look into on any of these particular topics we'd be happy to do our best Hassan with your hand raised thanks Austin uh, I'm, I'm I think this is a this would probably be a great idea, especially for for the smaller uh, utilities out there. I mean, I'm thinking of the model of the Energy Trust of Oregon, where it, where they do this with energy efficiency. Uh, so really, the, I think the main questions that we'd want answered would be: uh, Is this organization a government ent entity, or is it like the Energy Trust of Oregon, or is it a separate nonprofit? Uh, and secondly, how involved is it in the implementation of energy assistance? Is, is it just a pass through that's just collect funds and then distribute it to uh, utilities or community action partners? Or is it actually implementing programs? Uh, because I think that that would make a big difference on, on how extensive this, this project could turn out to be. Thanks, Hassan. Hopefully. Um get your input and uh, thoughts on, on things we'll need to consider um, or have the legislature uh, consider if they're interested in this idea. Anita, please feel free to unmute. Hi, this is Anita from ClickTap PUD. Just a quick question in regards to this charge. So as it would roll down to the utilities, are the utilities gonna be Putting that back into the rate structure for the customers to pay to cover that expense and how would we separate that from the already identified burden and low income customers so they wouldn't be affected yeah those are good questions uh, you know it's uh it's possible that i mean i you know i tend to think that um if you charge a utility uh, an expense that one way or the other it's going to end up being paid by the customers um, and so you know whether it explicitly shows up on the bill or not is um, I mean I've definitely seen that uh, debated uh, a lot um, when these type things are, are you know come up whether it's transparent or not to the customer and then whether there's a um, you know a way to protect the people who are benefiting from it from also having to contribute to it, um, I I think generally that that can be done to you know to limit the the collection of the uh, the charge that funds the uh, the program uh, to the people who are not eligible for the program. There can be some people in the middle, you know, who well yeah they are qualified. But they haven't applied, and so we don't know not to put the charge on their bill. So you know, it could be a, a burden on someone like that, um, despite our best efforts. Okay, I just wanted to toss that out there. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's it's some good points. Anyone else want to? Maybe speak to this or suggest uh, anything commerce should should look into between now and our next meeting. Uh, questions you might have. So Austin Nicholas here again. One last question. Um, does have you guys thought about whether this would be a supplement to existing utility programs or like they do for the Energy Trust in Oregon, a replacement of existing energy programs? assistance programs. So uh, I think that that would be um, uh, an important clarification about, you know, what would the responsibility for the utilities be if such a 
program was put in place. And um, so I would encourage you to think through that and so that we have a better sense of, you know, what our responsibilities are under the program. Is it just collecting money and then turning it over to this organization, whether it's commerce or an independent entity, uh, who will then distribute the money? Or is it something else? Yeah, those are good questions, and, and they um, they lead uh, to the next uh, topic a bit too, because it this is like a I would say a pure version of where uh, the utility role uh, is limited to um, you know collecting the money, uh, probably you know flowing the money back to customers on their bills, maybe some communication about the program. But uh, it, it, at least, you know, in the kind of the full version of a system benefits charge, you probably replace the existing uh, um, energy assistance programs that utilities would offer. But we have thought about a bit of a hybrid approach that um, would leave the uh, utility programs in place. <clears throat> So should I talk about that, Austin? Yes, feel, okay. feel free to. And so this, this, there's a lot of text on this slide, um, but it it's quoting from uh, the bill that the legislature passed uh, last year that uh, has to do with investor-owned utilities. And <clears throat> um, really the, the piece of this that, uh, that, that I was interested in was the legislature picking a number of 5% as kind of what the, uh, the level of uh, expenditures that the utility uh, might make to benefit low-income customers in terms of bill assistance without it becoming too much of a of a burden on the other customers. So they, the legislature said, okay, up to 5%, the utilities should take care of that within their own customer uh, rates. And so uh, that, this doesn't apply to consumer owned utilities and it, it doesn't um, address the situation where a utility might need to go above 5% in order to meet those uh, long-term energy assistance objectives that we see in CETA and that we've all talked about a lot. And so um, one thought that we had was um, that we might propose or you know, at least offer to the legislature the idea of uh, sort of a, a over and above 5%, that part might get uh, spread statewide. The part, you know, as long as the utility can do uh, a good job within ener energy assistance within its own rates and stay under 5%, then they don't use the, um, the secondary mechanism, but, if you have a utility, and I, I guess I'd have to say that my guess is the reason this bill didn't uh, didn't really address the over five percent part is because with it addressed, you know, with it targeted at investor-owned utilities, they generally have a good mix of uh, customers of different income levels, and so there's maybe more capacity to use internal mechanisms within the utility to fund low-income energy assistance. But then if we look at uh, utilities that serve a smaller area that might have a higher proportion of low-income customers, maybe they would hit that 5% level and still fall short of being able to um, fully address the energy burden of the low-income customers that they serve. And so the, the, uh, this mechanism might uh, be 
a way for some of the utilities that have especially large percentages of low income customers to uh, be able to address that need without putting uh, an excess burden on the rest of their customers. So, so one way that the, uh, the extra amount might get funded would be say to take that, the utility might take that amount as a credit on their state taxes that they pay as public utilities. Uh, and, and if you did that, then uh, the public utility tax is basically covering some of the low income uh, assistance funding with the actual amount, you know, varying from utility to utility based on, uh, you know, their circumstances and the circumstances of their customers. Should we look at the next slide, Austin? Yeah, let's do that. Let me hit the resume slideshow. Um, so you've covered this. So here we got some drawbacks. Yeah. Um, so it, in, you know, in terms of um, how this would work, you know, it, the utilities would, within that five percent amount, the, you know, the, the need to uh, dedicate money to low income assistance would still be there, and that, uh, you know, could be a. a a substantial amount, one that uh, you know people people would not say that that's just nothing to be able to put five percent of your total revenue to uh, to the low income assistance program, and then uh, it also does have this problem that I mentioned before in response to the Nita's question about you know if we have people who are eligible but they don't sign up any of these mechanisms could, um, you, you know, basically make them pay for other low-income customers assistance that technically they're eligible for, but they uh, don't end up connecting, you know, for a variety of different reasons that can happen. So uh, anyway, it's, uh, it's an idea that we have, thought of uh, following the passage of that uh, that bill that was directed at IOUs. And I, I know it's a, a new concept, and so um, you may need to hear it explained more than once before you have a, a, you know, can understand what it is we're talking about. So uh, we'd be happy to, to walk through it um, again. And, and we'll, you know, definitely in the report, you'll see it explained a little bit uh, in a different way. And so that may be helpful too, in terms of uh, being able to give us your reactions to it, is to see, see it written down in the draft report. Any initial reactions or clarification that you'd like to get from Glenn or myself on this one? Yeah. Yeah, this is uh this is actually related to the previous um point. Uh the and, and I guess my question with with the previous model and mechanism, um, what ability would the utilities have to sort of kind of authorize and um collaborate on how those funds could be utilized to serve their customers? Or would the organization that commerce chose be sort of responsible for kind of doing that on behalf of the utilities customer base? I think with the systems benefit, system benefits charge um, that, you know, typically would have uh, uh, oversight mechanisms, uh, just kind of off the top of my head, I would imagine that it would uh, include both the uh, uh, intended beneficiaries of the program 
and the uh, the utilities, you know, in that oversight mechanism, you know, it might be a, a board of a nonprofit or an advisory committee for if it was a government program. But one way or the other, I would I would think um, there would be uh, that that oversight mechanism uh, for a program like that. And and then this is just an add-on comment to that. I think that again, I'm gonna I, I probably need to sit with both these concepts a little bit more before making too many uh, specific comments on behalf of the utility. So I'll I think I'd just like to add the comment that um, I think what feels challenging to me about that is um, you know I know across the state and even just across our county there's such a diversity of what um, the intended audience uh, of eligible assistance um, is and I think that there could be a challenge in the implementing it in a really broad kind of state or regional way that would be able to provide meaningful benefit for all the beneficiaries um, and and so I, I I think having you know additional elements of sort of utility um, control or participation or collaboration would be really key. Um, you know, I'm just thinking of some of the the challenges between, say, rural, rural and urban, or owner and renter. Um, different changes, you know, different quality of housing stock, things like that. I, I think it could be really hard to try to implement it in a very broad way um, that might not be as targeted. But again, I I need to kind of sit with it and and read through the concept and think through it a little bit more. Thanks, Jeff, uh, for those comments. Yeah, I'm a, um, I'll say one thing that might um, also help us, and uh, Anna mentioned it a little bit earlier, is trying to understand a little bit more about uh, program participation rates as they are right now, as, as well as um, what participation rates look like um, for other programs. Uh, uh, such as the low income programs at DSHS and trying to see um, how those compare and any lessons we can learn from, from those programs um, that might give us insights into, um, into that work um, at, at a state level. Ginger, you've had your hand raised for some time. Uh, yeah. And, comments. yeah, so first of all, I would say that, it, Glenn, you just referred that you needed to have more uh, descriptions or having a little bit more opportunity for people to learn about this program. And I would say from consumer's perspective, I definitely belong to that group. <laughs> and right. yeah, if, if I don't understand, then that'll be harder for me to explain it to people who are going to help the community, help the families. So I appreciate what you say here because all this time you're explaining, I was like, Hmm, what does that mean by this and that? And and I will have to do more homework and maybe learn more about this. And uh, and so my comment here is also thinking about if programs like this got rolled out, are those who are underserved will have the equal opportunity being assisted to participate in the program. And because we already know we are missing uh, some populations, would the program like this address the, the issues that we have identified? That's my first question. And the second question is that we all know um, if we roll out a big programs like this that is statewide, then very often that lose the flexibilities on the local level. Are there like a safety net funds or that kind of support will also put into the places to make sure that if there are some locally uh, needs can be addressed rather than blanket wise, say, hey, everybody will be the same and this is how we're gonna do it. So these are some of the questions I have and how would this actually link to even SSI? I think it's not only DSHSs, right? You know, people who, who are receiving SSI likely will be also the population who will need that. And how will the, this big system can actually talk to each other to ensure that we access to 
those uh, who are very low income? And lastly, uh, how will people who might, like seniors whose income might be a little bit, uh, when, when they get low, right? You know, when, when they become seniors, the income is lower. However, they are not low to the degree. However, if they also need assistance, how does it look like? Because when you become ill, then you have more medical expenses. And for the families who have to kind of choose paying for utility or, or use less utility to, to substitute their funding, the money they have, their resources to pay for medical bill or something, how will programs like this also give the flexibility to, to the energy burden per se? not just only low income that way. So I, I do, I think I have more homework to do, learn more about what, how this would look like, yeah. Well, I think those are really helpful comments, Ginger, and they, um, you know, we're, we're trying to, uh, we've got a lot of homework on our plate too, to, to, to think about these questions more and uh, how, how each one of these might, uh, be uh, rolled out or useful and kind of think through uh, potential challenges and um, benefits of them. So I appreciate you putting those questions on, on the table for us to, to consider and hope that we can revisit those um, as we go forward with the report. So either on the, the systems benefits charge or the 5% the revenue threshold, any, any more thoughts on these uh, two mechanisms? And they can be uh, initial thoughts and you know we're not gonna to hold you to uh, your comments. John, please feel free to yeah, as long as you're not going to hold me to my comments, I have an idea. Like, I'm just curious um, how much utilities could save if this, if discounts were administered through, or assistance was administered through a centralized program. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have a good answer to that. Um, I'm guessing, you know, it's it's a different program that they're running over in Oregon. They're they're aimed at energy efficiency, but maybe we could get some uh, uh, learn a little bit from how they've uh, rolled out the program and the cost there. Um, last time we had talked, uh, Avista uh, had mentioned that uh, the program administration uh, costs uh, increased significantly for the state. Um, it wasn't clear to me if um, a, a Vista's contribution had uh, had increased, um, and so maybe maybe they have some input for the folks who are working down there in Oregon as well um, on the, on their utility work. Obviously, this is a, a different program, a different um, sort of idea here, but uh, still might be useful to look there as a case study. Thanks, John, for that question. Gotta write it I down. Address the question that was in the chat. From, yeah, I haven't seen that. Go for it. Glenn. From uh, from Micah Park, it was about any if we had any estimate about um, how long it would take to put a program in place, and um, we don't have any any very uh, solid idea at all about that. Um, but my sense is that the um, the system benefit charge would probably take a couple of years to get set up uh, if the legislature approved it, uh, because it would require you know setting up a new system of uh, collecting the charges and and uh, establishing the eligibility uh, verification type processes and uh, then getting the money back to the utilities. Uh, my sense is that the second idea, the uh, where the the utility programs operate within that first five percent, 
and only the amount over that uh, gets uh, paid for by the, the overall taxpayers. That's one that I, I think could be uh, implemented more quickly. The, uh, you know, it relies on existing utility programs for the most part. And even the, the overage part uh, could be uh, uh, run through this, the, basically through the utilities tax return. So that, that's something that can be implemented uh, fairly quickly. So probably less than a year to do that. But those are about as solid uh, uh, a response as everybody say in their comments, well, here's what I think so far, but I'm not sure. So I'm in that same camp. Thanks, uh, Glenn and Micah. Um, all right, well, if we don't have, we can always return to these as people um, think about them some more. I'll skip on to the next idea, which uh, is related to this one and that it was comes from the same bill um, or the idea comes from the same bill that was passed last year for the IOUs. Um, but modifies a different section of, uh, uh, of law. Uh, the, the idea for this uh, is broadly to extend the provisions in the bill that relate to program design, outreach, um, enrollment, and eligibility uh, to uh, COUs as well. Um, so I listed a few things on this. Uh, very uh, messy slide here um, that, that uh, highlight those things. Um, so the first one it would be, uh, it would require uh, the, the COUs to offer both bill discounts, uh, grants, other forms of assistance to both um, uh, senior households and all low income households. Um, so it would uh, require opening up um, programs for all low-income uh, households to benefit. It kind of goes back to the conversation we had earlier about two-thirds of the programs being open to low-income households and uh, cer certain parts of, um, of the state that do not have uh, uh, programs outside of voluntary donations available to, to low-income households. Um, the second bullet here, um, it, it talks about outreach and uh, would require that the consultation with uh, low income and equity advisory groups um, before things were approved uh, by utility governing boards. Obviously, uh, those advisory groups, uh, at least to my knowledge, do not exist today. Um, maybe utilities do have something in place that I, I do not know of, um, but it would require setting those up. Um, and then running program design questions, eligibility, et cetera, through, through these groups. Um, it, uh, the law has a, a very a general statement about conducting substantial outreach for their programs. And it has some specific requirements that be uh, semi-annually, I think, and lists a number of different um, ways in which that could be done. And I've included those in the report. And then uh, it requires annual reporting to the UTC for the IOUs. So here I would just clarify that the, those reports would probably come to us, Commerce, and go to the state auditor for compliance purposes, just as the, the current reports are being done. Um, so let me uh, skip on over to my next slide here. Um, a few other things with that were included in this bill, I thought Cher and Anna had mentioned earlier. Um, there is kind of permissive language around automated programming and matching customer accounts uh, with recipients of uh, means-tested programs from the state. It's uh, again, permissive. Uh, I'm unaware of the utilities uh, doing this, but uh, maybe they can, the IOUs can help us understand uh, whether they have or have not pursued um, this option available in the law. And then it includes some kind of 
consumer protection measures for low-income customers who would be auto-enrolled. Um, that's the same thing that we had before. Um, uh, strengths, uh, again, would be that we would uh, opening up programs to all low-income households uh, across the state for the consumer-owned utilities, as, as many of them do not have those in place right now. Um, improved outreach, community engagement, et cetera. Um, and then the permissive language that we talked about, um, auto enrollment programs and streamline, streamlining enrollment. Um, uh, some drawbacks, uh, one would be that we'd wanna make sure that the advisory groups were set up in a, in a thoughtful way and uh, include the right folks, make sure that the utilities know the organizations and their service areas to contact. Um, and, and utilities might already uh, have this information and that'd be great uh, to know that. Um, so there'd be additional reporting requirements, uh, which are never fun. Um, there's uh, the auto, it would not, you know, require auto enrollment, which may be a, a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, and it doesn't require utilities to make use of federal or statewide resources um, that would that seem to occur under like a systems benefit charge. Um, and it, it doesn't necessarily create a list of best practices to help utilities in their outreach, et cetera. Um, so uh, that is the idea with the extending this over uh, to COUs. Um, it would not be a, a state-run program. This would be building on the existing uh, framework that we have in place um, uh, for running assistance programs through utilities. So any initial thoughts to this um, from our COUs or even hearing from our IOUs about their experience at um, working uh, under this law? Jane, why don't you, uh, you raise your hand first. Happy to get your question or comment. So Jane Zendai, Commissioner at Clark Public Utilities. Um, wow, I just like, you know, think back and to our foundational parts of PUDs. And really, you know, my first thought is that in the best way we can help our low income customers and all our customers is to keep our costs low and our rates low. And I think we need, especially for customer owned utilities. Um, so I'm, I guess, and I think I just feel, I feel like I'm not something that would, I might have said a few years ago, but just somewhat troubled by wanting to add so much more to what you want. And, you know, Clark's not one of them and we have robust programs and a large staff, but you just, we heard today about utilities that have trouble, you know, getting outreach and doing stuff. And now ideas are to do more. So I wanna like, have you thought about going the other way and offer incentives or benef extra benefits or something to utilities that could, you know, apply to be part of your pilot program. And so that would reach the utilities that, you know, want to do more, but don't have the resources right now, instead of a one size fits all and, you know, take money from us to the state to give back to us. I just think we're making things way more complicated and um, making it more difficult frankly, to um, meet the needs of our low-income customers. Yeah, I appreciate uh, those comments, Jane, and uh, consideration of rates, as well as uh, troubles that utilities might have in outreach um, uh, currently, uh, as is, uh, let alone further requirements um, on, on this uh, important work. Um, I think uh, uh, as a clarifier, this would um, this is not a, a within the system benefits charge of uh, collecting funds uh, from utilities and redistributing them. This is uh, 
as it is right now in the, in the report, a kind of a standalone thing. I'm sure there's ways in which uh, they could be blended um, together. Um, and I think uh, it's an important question about whether uh, utilities, the consumer and utilities have capacity for this work um, and what they would need to, to fulfill any sort of uh, requirements uh, like the ones that are uh, being presented here. So appreciate your comment. Thanks. Thanks, Siri. Anybody else have uh, thoughts um, on this work, this idea? Anita. Thank you. Um, yeah, just a little overwhelmed, I guess. When you look at it for um, a small utility, rural utility point of view, that almost means we have to hire more people or, or come up with new funds to pay somebody to do this for us. Because speaking for Quigs at PUD, we have one person that would have to be in charge of everything and is already overwhelmed. So it's just something to consider. Yeah, I appreciate you uh, raising that. Um, it's good for us to uh, have that. And I think, you know, uh, I'm adding things to our drawbacks list that aren't on the slide, of course, right now, but um, I'm, I'm taking notes, so I appreciate it. Other folks uh, that either are, I think this would be a, a better uh, step in the right direction for outreach or our concerns that we would have uh, rate increases or staffing challenges or just uh, we don't, if we were required to do this today, we wouldn't know what we would, what we would do, um, those sorts of things. Uh, anyone who feel like they already, or the consumer owned utilities already do some of this work and it wouldn't be a new requirement. And we have Sheila. Sheila, would you like to give us your perspective from Okanagan? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, uh, agree with uh, Jane and Anita a bit, and then also just kind of add in um, some thoughts because um, it's <laughs> there's a pretty big, big difference between one consumer owned utility to the next, right? So none, some of us are pretty huge and some of us are pretty tiny. Um, and when you look at anybody, even medium sized, you are pretty much guaranteed if you're gonna start requiring specific programs and more reporting and all of that, you are gonna be hiring additional staff. Um, you are gonna be increasing your costs, whatever the expenses of those programs would be all of that um and and i'm just curious when i talk with a lot of other consumer owned utilities we're all doing things to support our customers and our low income seniors vulnerable populations in general so then the question for me kind of becomes why are we requiring something that we're, most of us are already doing to some extent can we do better of course we can. So I understand getting some best practices shared out. That would be fantastic. Some of us just don't have the resources to know maybe, or, or the opportunity to know where to focus our resources. So getting that guidance makes some sense. But once you put requirements on it, and especially, I mean, in Okanagan, in general, 20% of our population is low income. So when you talk about trying not to burden low income, <laughs> that's a lot of our people. So when we talk rate increases um, to fund programs, you know, we're burdening one to lift the burden of the other. And at that point, it may, may not make sense. And, and of course, when we're talking about elected boards um, and commissioners, you're also talking about local control. And when you start talking, taking any of that away, that's when it gets really difficult for public utilities to, <laughs> to really get on board with some of those requirements. So those are my thoughts, um, and I appreciate you guys having this conversation with us. Yeah, thanks, Sheila, for for sharing those those ideas and um, and and kind of the, the perspective that you guys have on you know needing uh, 
or you know, knowing that you probably you need to add staff and that um, you know, I'd like to to hear more. Hopefully, at, you know, either today or in the comments about what utilities are are doing around around this work um, to get a better sense of uh, you know. Um, you know, help the legislature get a better sense of, you know, what would be the benefit of, of this work um, versus, you know, are people already doing this, um, that sort of thing. And this uh, requirement is, or this, you know, proposal, uh, it, it does stand alone right now um, from the others. And, uh, and so there is no sort of mechanism to, you uh, like in the 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 five percent threshold, or maybe even the system benefits charge to protect uh, customers from rate increases that would come from these uh, particular requirements. But it could be blended, of course, with uh, these other areas, and maybe protections could be added there. Um, any other thoughts? This is all helpful feedback. I appreciate it. Well, if not, um, we'll scoot along uh, to uh, the other areas um, that I have to resume my slideshow here. Um, that, that we've talked about in the past. This was back in June, and it seemed to me at the time that we didn't we we're missing some folks um, from that conversation. So we kind of did our relaunch of our, our webinar series last, starting with our last meeting on August uh, 16th and now with this one. Um, so I thought it would be good to go over these um, with folks and get uh, everyone's uh, perspectives. And again, uh, there'll be public comment periods um, and an additional workshop to talk about uh, these. Um, mechanisms if, if folks want to. Um, so there is um, one of the ones in the statute is public and private funds. And when we talked uh, with our energy assistance advisory team, which is a, a group of um, utilities advocates um, who, who are working on this to support us in this work, um, we, we interpreted public funds uh, to be state general funds and private funds to be new or innovative ways to receive customer donations. And the strength here would be that these donations would take place outside of um, utilities rates and um, the same with the state general funds. And so it wouldn't create rate pressure. Um, the drawbacks are the, the reliability largely around these, these funding sources. Uh, public funds would require legislative authorization um, and donation-based programs, according to the reports that we got back in February from the utilities are generally uh, unreliable uh, and, and fluctuate a, a great deal. Now there might be new ways of running those programs that uh, stabilize, um, donations more um, from folks or by easier access for people to make donations and uh, we would welcome any examples of that or work that folks have been doing or know of in this recommendation. Any thoughts on public and private funds as a mechanism for additional assistance? If not, uh, there's always an opportunity to review what, what's written about these in the report and uh, to add comments. Um, so there's two other mechanisms. Uh, one is a low income specific discount and uh, the other one is uh, entitled customer rates. And for both of these, uh, these are terms that are provided by the legislature. Um, and uh, they aren't defined, so, so we're working to define them. And um, so uh, here we, we tend to think of a, a low income specific discount as something different uh, than uh, just a, a lower kilowatt hour rate. 
on a household's electricity bill. At least it could be that. Um, so um, one of the, the opportunities here would be to look at um, like a fixed, uh, fixed uh, rates uh, to adjust those. Let's see here, do I have my additional slides? No, I don't. Um, anyways, um, to adjust fixed charges or waive them. Um, uh, it could also be uh, uh, tweaking uh, the rate structures themselves. Um, and so, uh, you know, some of the strengths of this uh, is, is that we could better target uh, low income households and they're easy to adjust. Uh, relative to some of these other stru uh, structural changes, um, and some of our uh, some of the drawbacks that we noted were uh, that they do not the low in income specific discounts do not directly address energy consumption um, the the way that energy efficiency measures would, and that general observation that folks who are not signed who are eligible for the program but who are not signed up would. Uh, like may have uh, higher rates as a result of uh, increased uh, discounts. So that's what we have for this one. Glenn, did I miss anything? I, I stumbled around there for a bit, but <laughs> I, did I capture it? Um, I, I, you said the things I would have said. So, um, you know, it definitely, I, and as I said at the beginning of this workshop, there's there's quite a few different ideas that could fall in this general area. So um, if people have ideas about, you know, one particular thing that would seem good or that has worked well uh, when they've seen it implemented, uh, we'd be glad to hear that. It wouldn't have to be just the concept at its broadest level of the uh, specific discount on rates. Any thoughts on this one or um, even the customer rate design, uh, which is which is the, the, the remainder of the slides that we have here, that very much, uh, you know, these two overlap. Ginger. Yeah, I just have a thought here, you know, doing this, all this presentation here, how does that apply to like families who want to put solar energy, like solar panels, right, to, to their household on the roof, and then eventually that save the, the energy bill as well? How does that impact that? And what would be the mechanism linked to earlier, you talk about private donation, right? How, how could that be possible that give more flexibilities to, for the households that have an extra energy, kind of surplus energy uh, donated back, if we have a program to encourage them to install it? And maybe some low-income families as well, if, that, if they own their home, right? And we have the discount program may, or the or the or a system program for them to put up the solar panel that becomes efficient, you know, energy efficient and sustaining their own uh, the 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 energy bill as well. So I was just wondering how this could you know all link together with that. I tend to, uh, that's a good question, Ginger. I tend to think of uh, the rates and the low income discounts as being separate, but um, I admit that I there, there's probably a connection there that I haven't thought of. Um, we do have other uh, mechanisms for assistance here uh, that include the, the distributed energy resources, uh, maybe a discount for participation in uh, demand response programs, which are, are more on the energy efficiency side, at least the way I think of them. And then uh, there is at the top, uh, we talked about in the definition of energy assistance being customer ownership of, uh, of distributed energy resources. 
And um, we don't have that any conversation about much of any of those topics in, in the first draft, but are open to diving deeper into them uh, in the second. I don't know if Glenn or anybody else has a comment that they help uh, answer a Ginger's question or provide us further context. I mean, it, to me, it, it sparks a thought, uh, which I think is a good thing that, um, you know, the, the rate discount, uh, it does, you know, provide a, a really tangible uh, benefit to the customer. Uh, but then it, it it may affect other decisions in ways that aren't, you know, aren't what we intended. Because it, you know, like the, the payback on a solar installation would be half as good if you only charge the customer 50% of the, the retail cost of the electricity. Um, some of the um, incentive, you know, the incentive to... Uh, go for energy efficiency measures can, can be affected by that too. Um, but I also think about, you know, that there are uh, programs that that uh, could be developed that target renewable energy for uh, low-income households, either individually or on a community basis. You know, and those might operate kind of independently and without really having to go through a, uh, a mathematical calculation that's based on a discounted rate. So there's lots of thoughts that come up in response to, uh, to Jen, Ginger's uh, comments. Yeah, thanks, Ginger. And Jeff, you raised your hand, either in response to Ginger's question or another thought that you have. Well, it, it's kind of both. It's and again, this is a the disclaimer of this is a first blush, and we will be a little bit more thoughtful, kind of looking with our colleagues across our utility, and then respond informally in the comments. But I guess the thing I just keep thinking about here too is, you know, I think the the statute makes it clear that you know we have to provide energy assistance, but the goal is the reduction of energy burden and. You know, as we've thought about maximizing um, the investment we're making in that regard, for us, it's the natural connection between energy efficiency and um, billing assistance in order to really, you know, kind of stretch the dollars as best we can if we're really trying to reduce energy burden. And so, um, obviously, we have a rate discount and we've had one since the 80s, and, and it's really important to us. But as we think about like the future and we think about trying to make progress towards the 2030 and 2050 goals, I think what we recognize is, um, you know, in order to, to meet EIA goals and CETA goals, we've got to pay a lot of attention to our solutions being multifaceted solutions. And so where I'm not sort of saying, let's not advocate for all utilities to accept a rate discount, I still think a rate discount in and of itself is not going to be an effective enough solution um, at, at reducing energy burden possibly. And I am a little bit colored by kind of what we see in our community, but um, you know, given some of the housing stock and things like that, I, I think billing assistance alone could be, you know, a lot of funds that maybe don't yield the type of return that we would really like to see when we think about kind of a 2030 or 2050 timeline. And so for us, that's, that's just something we're thinking about. And I guess I wanted to put that out there as a, you know, conceptually. Thanks, Jeff, for sharing that. And that, that kind of also gets to the discussion we had at the top about these different mechanisms and potential trade-offs and that strengths and weaknesses of these. Um, Jeff, I, when I think about um, like the community solar and the intersection uh, with energy assistance, uh, one thing that I'm not very well informed about, um, but that pops into my mind is that uh, our agency, Commerce, has sent uh, clean energy funds 
I believe, over to you guys to develop a, a program that would support uh, low-income households. Are you at all aware of that? Um, yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, so we're currently um, building a community solar array, and the way we've set it up um, is for 100% of the production incentives to go towards income qualified customers. And so kind of our current model is again for those initially um, to leverage our current partner that handles our customer donation pro program called Project Pride um, to use these as additional funds for Project Pride, which is um, crisis assistance or billing assistance. Um, and, and so that's, that's the, the plan for that one but 100% of that production will go to those customers. And we, we certainly plan to include that on future energy assistance uh, reporting. But again, it, it is one of those where now, as we think about sort of like our net new programming or you know redeveloping what we're working on, what we're really trying to think of, you know, for our existing energy efficiency programs, do we have the right, um, you know, levers within those programs to make sure that we can kind of share and, and make sure that the energy efficiency um, program and program participation can be reached by our income qualified customers. Um, and are we able to target it right to those customers that maybe we haven't heard from or previously um, connected to those types of programs? Um, because I think what we really want to see is we want to see improvement in both, right? We want to see consumption lowered and we want to see the bill go down um, and, and, and we want to see it, you know, solve for what we need to report for Energy um, Independence Act and, and for CETA when we can. Yeah, thanks, uh, Jeff, for that additional detail and uh, kind of seeing it again from the, the different uh, reporting requirements even outside of CETA and how that affects, um, you know, how utilities are pursuing are, are pursuing these programs and thinking about them. It's helpful. Well, um, we do have these other ones here. Um, and the, uh, looking a little bit in the comments that we get uh, for a response as to whether uh, these are uh, topics that you'd really like us to dive deep into, we will um, we will do a little bit I, um, between now and uh, the, the, the 27th. I'm uh, particularly focused on the last bullet here, um, energy efficiency services for renters. This was something Teresa brought up at the top of our call. Um, and uh, a number of utilities highlighted uh, their work on this issue. Um, and I'm asking uh, folks if they have additional information on, on their work or would like to share, um, you know, barriers and successes um, that, they've, that they've had uh, doing this work to include it in the public comments. Um, it might not make it into the report, which I hope the second draft, which I hope will uh, come out a, a week and a half later. Um, I'll do my best uh, to get uh, public comments into that document reflected there, but um, we'll also have additional time to, to incorporate uh, material um, afterward. Well, if uh, none of these uh, topics here are springing anything to mind, um, I would also like to remind folks uh, that there is a provision in the law that asks us to assess mechanisms to prioritize assistance to those households with um, a higher energy burden. And in the past, we've talked about um, tiered incentive structures perhaps improving existing data resources so that we can better understand who these households are uh, and, and their circumstances and how we can best address their needs. Um, folks had talked about doing needs assessments and tailoring outreach to underserved populations. Um, in the past, that was suggested here. And I, I did see that a lot in um, some of the reporting that we received. Um, back in February. 
And then comments around streamlining the application process. Again, Commerce uh, did not take a, uh, did not write a lot, if anything, on these topics, but uh, we're gonna look at them. If there are other mechanisms you think we should be considering, um, we're open now in the last few minutes of talking about that. And then in the public comments as well, the written comments. So any thoughts about ways we can prioritize folks with higher energy burden or any one of these particular items here that jumps out to you as something we should really look into? I think Glenn, I kind of hinted that we, we could be wrapping up soon if we, we move through this. So maybe that's why we're getting focused on our, <laughs> there. We're ready to be done, Austin. <laughs> that's right. That's so, right. Well, you're probably feeling that way too, Austin. It's, uh, you're, you're, uh, you've been on the spotlight the whole time. So, so what the poor folks had to listen to my voices the whole time. If, Appreciate folks coming back a second time for <laughs> to going through this workshop with us. Um, so um, let's wrap this up uh, and talk about next steps. And then I, I'll show our uh, web page here briefly so that you, everyone knows where the materials will be at. So in the next week, um, I hope to make an announcement about community conversations. And uh, these are the conversations we hope to have with uh, low-income households and folks with lived experiences. I've been uh, working on exploring our options for how we can conduct these and what would make the most sense uh, for uh, folks to get their time and get their gather their input. Uh, so I'll be working on that in the next week. And um, I have a list of folks um, who, who uh, regularly work with uh, low-income uh, communities on these issues and that wanted to be a part of this, I'll reach out to you. Um, this is not uh, tailored for uh, utilities or our uh, community action partnerships. It's, it's gonna be a closed uh, meeting for, for these folks so that we can gather their thoughts um, independently. Um, so then on September 9th, um, in our CEO bulletin, we've asked folks to submit their 2030 and 2050 funding assessments. This is uh, section 120 of the law, uh, subsection 4.3. We talk a lot about these 2030 and 2050 uh, funding uh, targets that are set in the law. Um, the utilities must conduct these assessments. Uh, I initially had thought that folks had not done this work um, and that's why it was not part of the submission back in February. So I did not ask about it during our smart sheet work um, and, and instead floated the idea that commerce could work to get a good guesstimate of what these targets would be. Some utilities reach out to us and said, hey, we have the targets. Uh, we just didn't think we needed to submit them. And we really appreciate if commerce didn't <laughs> uh, calculate these. Um, because our service territories, et cetera, it, it could get messy. And so uh, that that's, uh, works for us, um, but we are hoping that folks could submit these, um, these uh, funding uh, levels to us um, by September 9th. Uh, that's just a deadline to keep people motivated. If you need longer, uh, let me know. But I'll expect uh, on September 9th that unless you've reached out to me that we've received all that we're gonna receive. Um, unless there are any questions on that, um, the, the next few uh, things here is the September 16th comment deadline for, on the draft report. And then I have some spreadsheets that I've mentioned for folks to review on our web sheet. If you have changes to that, uh, let me know. Um, and we'll have our last workshop on September 27th. And there'll be another comment deadline on October 14th. Um, for folks. So that's the overview of our work coming up. Happy to take any questions and I will show you real quickly on our web page um, where you can find all these materials that I just referenced and what they look like. I was thinking too uh, uh, last night as I was pulling 
uh, the final touches and maybe I do a little quick recording and send that out for folks who weren't here today so that they can see as well where this stuff is. Um, I'm going to share my screen. So uh, this is our CETA Energy Assistance web page. It pops up if you put CETA and Energy Assistance in the Google, uh, but the uh, web address is up here uh, for reference. Um, you scroll down and uh, today is our workshop and our materials are here. There's the agenda, the presentation slides that we showed. The first draft report is here. It's in a Word document form. Um, so if you want to mark it up, feel free to mark it up. Um, but I'd appreciate if you uh, summarize your high level comments for me um, separately. And if you open this document, um, you will see here uh, the request for public comments on the first two pages it explains what we're doing. And then um, this first draft, what it is, the request for public comments by September 16th. And I've posted, put some questions in here and I've asked folks um, when they set, submit their public comments, typically folks submit them in a, a PDF or a Word document that they summarize their main point, their kind of action item that they'd like us to take and bold and with a with a number by it or bulleted and then provide an explanation below. And so I provided an example of that there. Um, if, if folks could do that, that would help me process the comments faster. Um, and then I have uh, the, the request for additional information here. And we've talked about this throughout today's workshops. What are utilities doing with tribes? Um, tenant housing is something that we're going to take up going forward. So ask folks about that. And then there's uh, some instructions and references to spreadsheets, which I'll show you. And then for our consumer owned utilities, I'm particularly interested in making sure that um, my understanding of the consultation process that you, uh, that you guys are undertaking with your community organizations is it's explained properly. Um, and so I want to ask you guys in particular, to take a look at that. Um, and then you just have a report here uh, for, for your review. So going back to our main page, um, I'll show briefly here, there's the Excel file. This file contains a number of things. Um, let's see here. So it's the instructions on the first page for the different tabs. Now, uh, the first tab here is uh, the data that I'm using to, to make conclusions about utilities, low income programs. Um, as this is a, a file that was downloaded from Smartsheet. So it was all the input that we got there. It all looked great. Um, and it looked like there was no erroneous um, data entries as part of that process, which was great. So I downloaded that. And then I took, um, we had asked about low income participation and we had um, these different categories here. And so I've weeded out um, uh, all of but the donation-based programs um, that, uh, that are, that where we know that they're low income only households participating or the utility can identify the households and how much funding they received um, there. And then I, I, as I mentioned earlier, I made a classification of rate-based or donation-based program. And the idea there is to just distinguish the donation-based programs from other programs um, that are util largely utility funded. Um, if you think this term doesn't make sense or is confusing, let me know and offer the suggestions would be appreciated. Um, and then I went through and did the income eligibility uh, columns here based on what I knew about the programs and doing a lot of Googling um, and reading folks' web pages about these things. So if you uh, could take a look at those, make sure that I'm not uh, making any errors there, and then there's the data. Next uh, sheet here, um, for those of you who've worked with us on the clean energy implementation plans, this might look familiar. Uh, what I did is I took a look at the responses for the short and long-term plans that utilities 
have made um, and uh, have then categorized them into the columns here and indicated whether a uh, utility was taking uh, a, a particular action uh, under that column. Uh, so I won't go through all these different columns now. I will say that unlike the clean energy implementation plans, where I felt very confident in my work, um, and this, uh, this work here I feel less confident about because of the way in which the data was reported and, and, and reading through it. So please uh, take a look. And if you have a change, the instructions are on the intro sheet. But what you do is you highlight uh, the, the cell that you have the change in. And if you're adding something, you add a check mark, you copy and paste it over into the highlighted cell, and that'll be an addition. And then if you want to subtract something, just uh, highlight the cell and remove the, the uh, check mark. And then you'll send it to me at austinsharp at commerce.law.gov. And uh, I'd appreciate if you could throw something in the email that explains the changes that you made. Um, Finally, um, this is some work that the Energy Assistance Advisory Team asked me to, to do, and I'm not sure if I will use it or not. Um, but uh, folks uh, gave how much they spent on their energy efficiency programs in one part of the report, and then another part of the report, they were asked to calculate uh, the lifetime bill savings. And um, I took that data and cleaned it. Um, I've described that process on the intro sheet, but so that I could look at how much of the programs, how much we're as a state spending on those um, energy efficiency programs and what the savings were and what the investment ratio was. So for every dollar that we spend on energy efficiency, what are the annual savings? What are the lifetime savings? And the results of my work are here uh, for programs that reported funding, uh, energy efficiency, but didn't report anything in the conservation calculator, I removed those and vice versa. If you reported something in the calculator, but didn't tell me how much you spent on the program, I removed that uh, from this calculation here. If you have questions about this work, um, let me know. At this time, I don't plan on using it. So I don't, um, you know, I don't really, I'm not calling on folks, check it. Uh, uh, extensively, but if you're interested, you can take a look. So going back to our page, um, the last document you'll find on here right now is a summary of utility plans under section 120. And again, I have uh, highlighted key themes and group done by the utility types. Uh, you'll, you'll be familiar with the language in here because it's just, um, me taking an editing pen to, to what was already submitted. So if you uh, think I miscategorized or grouped your utility in the wrong area, um, or think that there's information that's missing that you previously submitted, um, uh, let me know uh, and uh, we can make changes to this document. As I said before, I don't plan to include it in the report, but I do plan on posting it. Um, to our web page with the report so that folks have it. Uh, the last document, which I mentioned in the chat during our break, I do have a document uh, where a few months ago I went through and I just cataloged, like this is what, um, if you rolled up all the different things that utilities are doing uh, on outreach, what would that menu of options look like? And uh, I, I do have a document that, that, again, isn't summarizing utility by utility or by type, but that uh, kind of says, okay, if I were a utility and wanted to know what others are doing, this is all the other work that's being uh, you know, done under these different types of outreach. So I will post that document as well. I'll, I'll clean it up and post it today. Um, finally, because this is today, um, and it will be in the past as of tomorrow. I will move this to the past workshops and deadlines, but I will include all the meeting materials under this comment deadline information. So all the stuff we talked about will be here. Um, this will be here too, but it'll be easier to refer to this tab because it will be at the top of the page. 
Any questions or comments? Anything else that I could uh, do uh, to help folks out either at our next workshop or in between that? And if not, you can always shoot me an email. All right, well, I've run out of water and I'm, I'm getting thirsty. I'm starting to have a hard time speaking. So I'll, I'm gonna wrap us up. I appreciate everybody uh, participating today. I know we covered a lot of different materials and, and ideas and I encourage you to, to think about them, to talk with your colleagues about them and to submit comments here uh, on September 16th. So appreciate it. Thank you, Austin. And thanks everybody who uh, stuck with us through this. We, we really appreciate your help. All right. Have a good Thank evening. Thank you to Stephen Duck, who has been taking notes in the background for, yeah. for commerce. So many thank thanks to Stephen. All right. Bye, y'all. Bye-bye. <laughs>